So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the battle that you guys face on college campuses, because I think it used to be that in the conservative movement, there was this lie that we told ourselves, particularly those of us who had graduated from college, that you know all the crap that we saw on college campuses, all these students, the ones who are woke, the ones who are irritating, the ones who are destroying the body politic, that when they got out in the real world, the real world would change them, right? They'd get jobs, they would stop being such annoying losers, they'd have to pay taxes, their, their pot smoking habits would eventually have to taper off. You know, all of these things we told ourselves. And instead, it turns out that those college students went out and they took over all of the institutions and they destroyed all of the institutions. And so the stuff happening on the campuses that you attend doesn't stay on the college campuses. It starts there and then it metastasizes out and destroys pretty much every institution in American life. And everyday Americans are now feeling this. By poll statistics, every single political subgroup in the United States, with the exception of people on the radical left, feels as though they can't say what they want to say about politics. That includes people who say that they are mainstream liberals. People who are sort of your typical Democrat voter, they feel that they can't speak freely about politics. And that is because their compatriots on the left know that they can cudgel and bully them into saying whatever they want. Now, all this, again, started on college campuses, and it continues to spring from college campuses, which is why it's so important that you all, ha you're on the front lines, you really have to fight back, you have to mobilize, you have to organize, and you have to be smart about it. So let's talk about how all this has happened on college campuses and within the institutions more generally. So there are three steps to taking over an institution. And we need to know how the left did it because we now need to do this in reverse. So the three steps to taking over an institution, number one, you have to win the emotional argument. Number two, you have to renormalize the institution itself, take over the sort of levers of power. And three, you have to close all the doors. So the way that the left typically has done this, they've won the emotional argument with another sort of three-step process. And you see this in the way that people argue on campus all the time. The first step is they take advantage of what I've called the cordiality principle. Why can't you just be nice? Right? Why aren't y'all just nicer? Every time you're in a political conversation with somebody who is of the left, you might bring up a fact, an inconvenient fact, a fact that bothers someone. And someone will say, well, you know, I'm insulted, it just isn't nice. Or maybe, you know, could you lower your voice? It just isn't nice. Just be a little more cordial. And conservatives, because many of us are religious, most of us have respect for other people, in fact, most Americans do, we tend to say, okay, you know what, you're right. We'll be cordial. Let's just not talk about politics. You know, better if we avoid this topic. We'll just come back to it later. Or maybe we won't come back to it at all. We'll just be cordial. Kind of, you know, not, not take it down from like a 10 to a 0, but we'll take it down from like a 10 to a 4. And then we can have a nice positive conversation without getting into the weeds of anything that might be remotely insulting. And we'll concede terminology in arguments. The most obvious, for example, being the entire argument that is now had over transgender pronouns. Right? The left case is you need to use the pronouns that somebody else chooses because otherwise you're just not being nice. It's not about fact or about being right or about being wrong. It's about being nice. Right? The cordiality principle. Be cordial. And again, conservatives are uniquely susceptible to this because in our lives, we tend to try and be cordial with other people. Many of us feel a religious obligation to be cordial with other people. So that's step one. The second step is sort of an extension of that. It's sort of a deepening of that principle, and that is speech is violence. I get this a lot on campus. This is where microaggression terminology comes in. And this is the idea that if you say about a man that he is a man, and he in fact wishes to be called a woman, this means that you have not just said something that is non-cordial. You've done an act of violence. You've put them at actual physical risk. You see this on campus all the time. The very language of microaggressions suggests this. Right? Microaggression isn't just something you said that was rude. It is an aggression. Microaggressions are to be met with macroaggressions. There was literally a professor at Cal State University LA, this is one of my first big YAF speeches, who posted this outside of his, outside of his office hours. He posted a sign on his door saying, Microaggressions should be met with macroaggressions. The idea being, of course, that you have done some sort of violence. And if speech is violence, then sort of by necessity, violence is also speech, right? If the equal sign goes both ways, then if you say something that is violent, it's okay if the violent comes right back at you. When I spoke at Berkeley, there were literally protesters, thousands of them outside, literally chanting, speech is violence. Which, by the way, is a terrible chant. It doesn't rhyme nothing. <laughs> but this has become sort of a rote point of contention on the left, that if you say something that offends somebody, you haven't just offended them, you've actually done them violence. That brings us to the third step. And this is one I honestly didn't see coming because it's so nonsensical and backward. It's, it's, it's so ridiculous on its face that it, it, like, it makes no sense. And yet we live in a society where nothing makes any sense anymore, so I guess it was inevitable. And that is the move from speech is violence to silence is violence. 
Now again, better chant, because this one rhymes, but even less sensical than speech is violence. And this is the idea, of course, that if you don't repeat exactly what people on the left want you to say in precisely the words they want you to say, then you have done an act of violence. Right? So we went all the way from, please be nicer in how you broach this issue, to if you say something that offends me, you've done violence to me, to I need you to just say what I am saying and repeat it over and over and over again. And if you refuse to do that, now you've done an act of violence. This is what you see online, for example, when Black Lives Matter is, is pushing its protests and many of those are resulting in riots. If you don't actually put a black square on your Facebook page, silence is violence. You are complicit, right? Your complicity is the problem. If only you weren't complicit, if only you just did the malice struggle session and repented all your sins and then said over and over and over the mantra that we want you to say, then all of your sins would be temporarily lifted until the next time we want you to repeat a new mantra, in which case all of your sins are restored until you say the new mantra over and over and over. And this particular tactic has been extremely successful for the left. Right? Moving all the way from cordiality principle all the way to silence is violence. Just repeat what we say and we'll leave you alone. And this is part and parcel of the second step, right, which is renormalizing institutions. So renormalization is a term that's used by the sociologist and thinker Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Right? He talks in, in his book Skin in the Game about this. Renormalization is where a small group of intransigent and extremely loud and annoying people can take over an entire institution. So think of a family of four. This is the example he uses. Think of a family of four, and one of the members of the family, usually the daughter, says she's a vegan. And, the, and she goes to mom, and she says, listen, here's the deal. I'm a vegan now. You can make two meals, right? One for the other three members of the family and one for me, or you can make one vegan meal for everyone. And mom, because she doesn't really have time, she says, you know what? It's not worth the hassle. Forget it. I'm just going to make a vegan meal for everyone. Okay, so now the entire family is eating vegan because one girl decided that she definitely needed to eat vegan and she was not going to skimp on this. Okay, then you take that family and they have a block party that week with three other families. And now the family says, listen, because of our daughter, we're eating vegan. That's just what we're doing now. And you, the head of the block party, can either make vegan for everybody, just do you know, chips and dip and, and salsa and all that, or you can make meat for everybody and vegan for us. And now the person who's the head of the block party has to decide, do I make two meals or do I make one meal? And so now you can have one person who's renormalized 12, 15, 20 people. Now, typically speaking, it doesn't work with one person. Typically speaking, the tipping point number is somewhere between 15 and 20%, apparently, according to a variety of studies. So if you get 20% of an institution, 20% of any group, to say that they are fixed on a point and they're not moving from the point, then you can get a bunch of other people who are in the middle to kind of go along just to get along. Because honestly, most people are conflict averse. People don't like conflict. The left counts on this. People don't, they're, they're not interested in fighting. They're more interested in having a nice day than they are in fighting with you. And if you're incremental in your approach, then you can get away with all of this. And this is what the left has done so successfully. They start off at a, at a corporation. They say something, 20% of the people will say, listen, all we're asking for, there are a bunch of diverse people here, all we're asking for is a little diversity and sensitivity training so that everybody here can be better educated on people who they are not. And everybody in the middle goes, well, sounds like kind of a pain in the ass, but honestly, like, are, these people are so whiny and they're just going to call HR and we might get liability issues and legal is telling us that it would be a better idea to protect ourselves by having a diversity training session. And so the company says, okay, diversity training. And then the next step is, okay, you know what, the diversity training, here's the thing, it's a little bit tepid. We need a little bit more. We need to understand that the institutions of our society are replete with white privilege. And that means it's not enough to have like typical diversity training where we learn to be nice to each other cross-culturally. We have to recognize our own privilege. And this requires us to bring in Robin DiAngelo or Ibram X. Kendi to talk about the inherent privilege of whiteness and how institutions are filled with this whiteness. And everybody in the middle goes, well, you know, this is more of a pain in the ass than, than the other thing was. But at the same time, they're also threatening us more. Like they're saying they're going to go on Twitter and Facebook and call us racist. They're saying they're going to go to the New York Times and run a whole story about how our company is steeped in white privilege. I guess we'll just do it. And you can see how this happens in every institution. Right? They start with just these kind of minor requests. And the minor requests become more and more major over time. Now, I will say I think that the left right now is moving too far too fast. I think it's why you're seeing blowback, for example, in the public schools with critical race theory. Because I think that the sort of turning up the temperature on the frog, if you turn it up too fast, the frog jumps out. I think they've turned up the temperature a little too fast and the blowback is going to be immense. But for 50 years, they've been turning it up pretty slowly and they've been able to get away with an enormous amount of change and take over the highest points in our institutional life because of it. 
put together these coalitions of the woke and intransigent. By the way, to get to that 20%, you don't actually require the full 20% to agree with everything you're saying. All you have to do is create a coalition that gets you to 20%. This is why on your campuses, what you will see is a bunch of student groups who apparently have nothing in common, all banding together in order to do X. Right, so if they want to ban a speaker from campus, something with which I have some familiarity, if, if they want to do this, what they will do is they will go get the LGBT group on campus, and they will side with the BLM group on campus, and they will side with the Muslim Student Association on campus. And those of us on the right, we look at this and we're like, hold up a second. You're telling me that the Muslim Student Association, the LGBTQ group, they're on the same side of this. Right? What, they have nothing in common. Right? This makes no sense at all. But you have to understand that it is a coalition deal. Right? They are trading away some of their priorities for the moment in order to achieve their higher priority, which is to renormalize the institution and achieve a set goal. Now, politically speaking in the United States, I think this is largely what has happened in our politics since about 2012. I think there's a historic shift in American politics. You guys are all really young, so this seems really long ago to you guys. But as you will see, as you get older, time starts to telescope. So for, for Governor Walker and for me, this is like five minutes ago. So the election of 2012, uh, which, which was not all that long, it's now nine years ago, guys, crazy. But the election of 2012 totally changed the country. For my money, a lot of people always say the most important election of our lifetimes is whatever the next election is. And typically, that's not very true. The, the 2012 election really was an important election for the following reason. In 2008, Barack Obama was still operating within the auspices of traditional American politics. Right? He ran as no blue states, no red states, United States. No blacks, no whites, just Americans. Right? This was the idea. We were all one. This is a very e pluribus unum. Right? In God, we try. He, like, he was running on motherhood and apple pie and the American flag. He really was in 2008. And then he came into office and he started proposing a very radical agenda. And the radical agenda, as it turned out, was really unpopular. And it spurred the Tea Party, which was a bunch of people who went out in the streets and they said, we shouldn't be spending this kind of money. This is crazy. You won a victory not on the basis of this. It sounds kind of familiar with what's going on now, actually. You, you didn't win a victory for this. You won a victory in order to you know, bring Americans together, and here you are proposing radical policy that tears us apart. Barack Obama loses Congress in 2010. In his own words, he takes a shellacking, right? And then his response is, everyone who opposes me is racist, right? If you, the Tea Party is racist. And if you read his memoirs, he says this pretty openly. Like He and Michelle would sit around watching TV and pointing at the Tea Party and saying, these folks are racist. And between 2010 and 2012, he decided he was going to move on to a different strategy. He's, I believe, the only president in American history who won fewer votes his second time than his first time around and still won re-election. Right? He won 3 million fewer votes in 2012 than in 2008. He won by such a big margin in 08, he could afford to do that and still win. But what he did is he, he decided to pursue a dream that Democrats have been pursuing ever since. And that dream was, what if I did renormalization on a grand scale in American politics? I will find a bunch of groups, I will appeal to them as identity groups. We will form a coalition. This coalition will be designated at taking down the hierarchies of power in the United States. And I'm not going to try to win every vote. I'm not going to try and make my message broad and appealing to a huge majority of Americans. Instead, I'm going to tailor my message to every specific group, cobble together just enough people to create a new coalition of the ascendant, and we will never lose an election again. The reason you have to understand this is because this is why people lost their minds on the left side of the aisle when Trump won. It wasn't just because it was Trump. It's because Democrats did not think they would ever lose another election after 2012. You can read their, the way they were writing in 2013. They thought they had created a new model in American politics. And this model was the renormalization model. It gets together all these coalitions. They will be the new majority, and everybody else doesn't matter anymore. And then Trump came along, and he took the people who they'd left out of their coalition, and he made them into their own coalition, and then he won in 2016. And now, President Biden is trying to rebuild the Obama coalition, and he's trying to do the same thing. This is why he's talking about equity all the time, for example. It's why he's taken a very left-wing position on racial issues. It's why he's decided that he's not going to govern as the so-called dead... I mean, he, he, look, Biden won for two reasons. One, he's dead, and two, he was perceived as moderate. Right? He's been able to keep only one of those promises. <laughs> and, Okay, that renormalization of American politics has had dramatic implications for all of our institutions, which have mirrored the same exact move over the course of time. Corporate America is now oriented against conservatives because woke people inside these corporations have taken over at least the levers of power inside a lot of these corporations. Not because they actually run the corporations, but because they know they can leverage the people at the heads of the corporations into doing what they want by heading on over to the New York Times and having the New York Times write a hit piece on the heads of the corporation. You see this in science, right? The scientific institutions, the place you thought was going to be untouchable, 
Right? I did. I thought scientific, science is a process, right? How do you screw with the process? Somehow they've managed to take scientific institutions and renormalize the institutions to the point where they are now repeating woke mantras as part of science. We saw this last year when you had people out in the streets protesting lockdown. That was totally going to spread COVID and kill everyone. But if you were out there spitting on each other for George Floyd, COVID didn't care. It was the wokest virus in all of human history. If you had the proper political principles, you were totally fine. And not only that, you were going to be told that racism was a public health problem akin to COVID, so it was totally fine for you to go out in the streets and do whatever you wanted to do. And you saw this again from the CDC in their original proposal for trotting out vaccines, which was not on the basis of age, which was clearly, clearly the scientific way to trot out vaccines. Instead, they, trans they said we should tranch out vaccines on the basis of racial equity, which is madness. I mean, utter craziness, which statistically, by the way, would have ended with more dead black people than if they'd trenched it out on the basis of age. Because if you immunize a bunch of 20-year-old black people and you skip a bunch of 65-year-old black people, even if proportionally speaking, the 65-year-old black people are less of a percentage of the total population than 20-year-old black people are, this would have ended with more dead elderly black people, right? This is clear as day in the science. Didn't matter. The CDC was promoting it anyway. You've seen scientific institutions renormalized. You've seen the media obviously renormalized. The media is just a weapon of the Democratic Party at this point. There is no question about this. The Democratic, I mean, the, the propaganda that they have subjected the American people to, particularly since 2016, is absolutely astounding. And then finally, the social media companies have basically fallen prey to all of this as well. Not only are they headed by people who are sort of congenitally liberal, as Zuckerberg has admitted, right, Silicon Valley is a left-wing place. Not only that, they've now been leveraged by the media and by the Democratic Party into basically suppressing freedom of speech and First Amendment freedoms on behalf of the government. They're private companies, but once they become government agents, they cease to be in the private sphere only. Okay, so what does this mean for you guys? What it means is we need to take some lessons from the left. Okay, what that means is we should not be quite as cordial as the left would wish us to be because they are not telling you the truth when they say they want you to be cordial. This doesn't mean be rude. It doesn't mean get up in people's faces, Maxine Waters style. It doesn't mean be a jerk. It does mean that if you are saying something true, you should not be so worried about who it offends. If you're saying a true thing that is backed by data and somebody gets offended, that would be a them problem. And you should, it is not incumbent on you to treat a fact as a, as a matter of unniceness, as a matter of meanness. You can't be cordial in these arguments. Frankly, honestly, this is one of the reasons that Trump existed, right? Is because Trump completely ditched cordiality to like the ultimate extreme. <laughs> and, and that was his charm, it was also his drawback, but there's a way for you to do it in a way that is very effective because it is not your job to worry about whether somebody's feelings are hurt. It is your job to worry about whether somebody's feelings are being unjustifiably hurt. Second point, if we're going to re-renormalize these institutions, right, if we're going to normalize them back to what they were, what that means on college campuses is that you're going to have to build coalitions. You're going to actually have to do some Barack Obama-style community organizing. You're going to have to actually go out there and form a hardcore of intransigent people on your campus who can create a solid front against whatever the left is doing. Okay, it's not enough for one or two people to speak out. It's not even enough for there to be just a YAF group on campus. You have to form coalitions with other groups, and then you should be intransigent, and you should be loud, and you should be aggressive, and you should push back. Because the people in the middle are going to either react by siding with you, or more likely they're going to, be react, they're going to react by throwing their hands up and saying, I don't want any part of this. And guess what? If people in the middle say, we don't want a pox on both your houses, right? we don't want any part of this, we all win. That is a victory. Okay, we don't have to turn all of these institutions right wing. We have to turn these institutions neutral again. Okay, now that's much harder on college campuses because unfortunately the renormalization on college campuses happened from above. It's not just coming from the student body, it's coming from the faculty, it's coming from the professors, it's coming from the administrators, and all the rest. But what that means is that you should do what the left has so successfully done at institutions they don't control, which is use the media. And I've said to everybody, that ever, my, my mentor Andrew Breitbart used to say this, and so I'll pass it on to you. You have a cell phone, the cell phone has a camera upon it, you're now reporters. You have all been deputized. Congratulations. Right, if you see something on campus that is newsworthy, send it to us at Daily Wire. We will 100% write it up. We'll get it out for you, and it will become a news story. People care these days what happens on college campuses, and we can turn those things into stories. It's good for us financially. It's good in terms of traffic, but much more importantly, it's better for the country if attention is brought to what's happening on campus. So you should for sure be doing that. And then finally, be strategic. Right, the left is strategic. They don't go all out all at once. Right? It requires a little bit of incrementalism. So that means don't lead with your chin. Right? Pick, pick your spots. 
pick points where you think that the left has clearly gone too far and fight there and push back because that's how you create winning coalitions. That's how you get people in the middle to side with you. You don't pick the outlying issue where you know you're in the minority. Instead, what you do is you pick the issue where the left steps too far. And good news for you, the left is doing this every single day. They're annoying. They're incoherent. They bother everyone. Right? On your campuses, most people don't care about politics. I mean, let's be frank about this. On college campuses, most people want to stup, drink, and, and basically get whatever grade they need to to go to grad school. Okay, that, that's what college campuses are for. What that means is that most of the people on campus are not politically motivated. Most of the people on campus want to be left alone. The left doesn't leave them alone. Right? That's why they cave to them. So if you go to them and they say, listen, you can side with us, we'll leave you alone. That's a pretty good pitch. It also happens to comport pretty well with a sort of conservative philosophy, which is that you are now adults and you, sh you should be treated like adults. And by the way, the conservatism also has, believe it or not, a much more compassionate side than liberalism, which is a woke religion without forgiveness. Right? The left is a woke religion without forgiveness. All they are interested in is digging up your old Twitter posts. All they are interested in doing is finding your bad old Facebook posts and then destroying you or holding it over your head blackmail style until you repeat what they want, silence is violence. Right? We on the right don't do that. We on the right are not going to hold things over your head. If you, if you run with us, you're going to lead a much happier life than if you run with the radical left. I've said before that I think the future of the country does not lie with the right and it does not lie with the left. It depends on what the people in the middle do. Those people in the middle can be convinced. So that requires you to be strategic, and it requires you to be outgoing and warm. And most of all, it requires you to be aggressive enough to confront the left without being so aggressive that you're off-putting to people in the middle. And I think all of you are capable of doing that. I think conferences like this arm you with the facts and with the strategies to do that. That's why I'm so happy to be here. And now I'm